What did you have for breakfast this morning? Well, it'll come as no surprise that it's the same thing I had yesterday and the day before and the last time we spoke. Which is the oatmeal? Lovely big bowl of granola with some fruit and bananas. Do you have a particular type of granola you like to eat? Yes. Cheap. Ross, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Chris. It's very nice to be here. For just to start with, um, to give the listeners some context of uh, who you are, perhaps you could introduce yourself and give a little bit of context of what you do. Well, sure. Um, I think I'd probably, well, I'm probably most easily described as a, as a performance coach, whatever the heck that is. Um, my background is, is a business background. I was uh, 30-odd years in the IT business. And uh, I had a full range of uh, uh, careers in there, and I ended up running a billion-dollar sales organization for a, a large technology company. And when I fell out of love with that, I decided that um, I wanted to do something different. And I've always really enjoyed with um, working with people as individuals and small teams. Uh, so I started uh, a coaching practice. Um, it was an accident. It was it was typical of these things, which is a, a second career is very often one that you fall into by accident and um, um, ended up as being a, a very pleasant surprise because I've I've enjoyed making my living doing this for many years now. Um, I coach a wide range of people. Um, I've, I've got a background with uh, coaching uh, golfers on the European and US PGA tours, um, professional musicians, business professionals, young entrepreneurs, mums and dads, kids, young golfers, all sorts of things. And uh, I get a great deal of pleasure out of it. It's uh, it, it's the thing that I find that makes me sparkle is watching other people sparkle. So that's what I do. And you 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 help with performance in all sorts, is that right? Some from business to to elite athletes to golfers, uh, actors. Yes, that's right. Well, I suppose we better narrow it down a little bit. So um, I help them for, with on the. Um, well, you could call it the mental side of things, um, even though that sounds rather grand. It's it's just helping people get out of their own way. Um, and performance is pretty much the same whether you're a classical guitarist or whether you're a billiard player or a snooker player or a footballer or a rugby player or, or a golfer. Um, getting at the skill that you worked so hard to acquire over an extended period is something that – well, virtually everybody struggles with at some point. Um, and I really don't think it should be quite as hard as uh, lots of people seem to make it for themselves. And um, my intention is to help them get out their own way so they can make use of the talents that they've uh, they've developed over the years. Um, perhaps we could start with like a, a story analogy, perhaps with uh, an individual, perhaps you worked with, uh, why don't we start with something a little easier, like um, a, a golfer. Because uh, I know you've worked with the likes of um, Darren Clark. Yeah, well, yeah, golfers. Well, um, golfers. I love the game. I used to be a pro myself many, many years ago. I was a dreadful golf golf pro. Um, but it gave me a... How long did you last before we move on? Oh, um, about 18 months. Okay. I just, I wasn't big enough. I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't good enough. But... I had a go at it. Um, I had a go at it, and I'm really glad, glad that I did. Um, but I'm really glad that I left it as well. Um, but uh, so I, I have some sort of a, an understanding of, of what some of these guys go through. But um, yeah, golf professionals. Let's start with them. Um, I've been really lucky. I've I've worked with some interesting people, like you said. I've I've, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Darren. I've worked with uh, Lee Westwood and Simon Dyson, and well, actually, a whole bunch of Chubby Chandler's guys because. Uh, over the years, I've got to know Chubby pretty well, and uh, every now and again, he'll sit me down in front of somebody who seems to be having a, a few uh, issues in, in uh, performing to their own level of expectation. And so I, I've had a ball doing that. I don't do that so much anymore, but uh, yeah, um, golfers are interesting because they seem to encapsulate uh, – all the other stuff that other sports people go through, um, but maybe on an even more obsessive basis. And uh, who better to start with than uh, the beloved Darren? He's just an amazing guy. A few years back, um, 
Darren and I were having a conversation about um, the best ball strikers he'd ever seen. And of course, you know, Darren still is, but at that time was was well up there in terms of some you know, one of the best ball strikers ever, really. And um, we went through a few names and there were a few names that surprised me in terms of um, how highly he regarded them as ball strikers. I won't mention any names here, but and I said, so, OK, so. But, you know, the quality of their ball striking and their world ranking, you know, they're, they're two different things, aren't they? And we started developing this conversation about um, what were the components necessary to, say, be a top 50 player. And, of course, the, the game is part of it. You know, you, you have your physical game, which is the long game, the middle game, the short irons, the chipping and the putting, etc. But um, there's also an element, luck, because we all get good luck and bad luck. And, and then there's an, another little bit, which seems to be the, the thing that makes the difference. And that's how people organize themselves uh, emotionally and mentally. Um, and how immune they are to bad breaks, if you like, or um, equally how immune they are to good breaks. They, they just go out and they take it one shot at a time. And some of them can be quite mercurial. Um, but what is it? What is it that makes a top player a top player? And it's not necessarily ball striking. So we came up with this notion of this thing called the mind stack. And um, over the years, it's it's been refined down um, a little bit. It was a little bit more complicated. But but nowadays, the way I would describe it now is if uh, let's say we, we talked about Darren, if he had a hypothetical. 100 units of skill that he'd acquired over his decades um, of experience as a playing professional. So he's got 100 potential units available to him. And these are all units that he's bought and paid for. These aren't units that are not present yet, if you see what I mean. So it's, it, it, we're not talking about hitting shots that he's not yet able to hit. These are skills that he has embedded in himself. And uh, I said, so on a regular basis when you're out there competing you got a card in your hand you're playing for your living big tournaments and small tournaments how how many units out of your hundred you regularly get access to that you can rely on day in and day out and do you know what his number was uh, i i would I, somewhere between yeah 50 60 something like that exactly 55 to 60 and you know, that amazed me. So we're, we're, we're talking world-class player here. So where, where did those other 40 units go? So then we got chatting about um, how hard Darren works because Darren has this amazing work ethic. He, he will work and work and work. And even at this stage in his career, he's out there beating balls and trying to improve and getting better. He's, he's, he's just got this amazing work ethic. So I asked him a question. I said, so if you've got 100 units right now, how long will it take you to acquire another three? And he thought about that for a bit. He said, you know, Ross, it's almost an impossible question to answer because it could be days, it could be weeks, it could be months. I don't know. And I said, so how does it work then? So let's say it takes you six months to gain another three units and then you only get access to half of them. Was that six month investment worth it for one and a half units? And he went, hmm. So we had to have a little think about that. And then we got onto this notion about if you're competing against other guys that don't have 100 units, let's say they've only got 75 or 80 units. And on your day, you get access to 55. And on their day, they get access to 57. They win. Right, So you don't have to get access to all of your 100 units, but if you got access to 60, 64, 68, 70, right, you're back in the top 50 in the world again. So it was an interesting one about where do these missing units go? And the answer, as best as we can tell, is that they don't go anywhere. We just get in our own way and find it difficult to get access to them. So when, when I'm talking about performance, I'm not talking about giving people skill they haven't got yet. I'm talking about helping them get access to the stuff that they've already earned. 
and uh, that seems that seems kind of fair to me. So when when Darren Clark is on, on the on the course, and uh, are, are you looking for like patterns to help interrupt, you know, um, or, or, or patterns that interrupt his his level of performance, or how did how did you want like observe what he was doing and then uh, sort of take that performance? level to the next higher you know further in in terms of units of performance well that's a great question the 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 problem with the question chris is that it's too intelligent a question um for somebody like me who always moves towards simplicity rather than complexity and so i don't think i can answer your question in, in quite the the way that you might expect um when i'm working with folks uh it is my intention to make this as simple as possible. And over the years, it's got incredibly simple, um, almost to the extent where um, I don't really care what the players are thinking, you know, because we'll have a conversation early on in our engagement where um, I'll try to explain how the world looks to me and how um, I interpret what's happening in people and people are free to go along with that or reject it. It's not my job to tell people what they should believe and what they should not believe and all the rest of it. But if, if they're willing to sort of entertain the possibility that there might be something of merit in the conversations that we're having, then I'll explain it to them really, really simply. And it goes kind of like this, which is any emotion that you might be experiencing is even though it may seem like it is, is not coming from the circumstance which you think might have generated it. Okay, so for example, um, if you are, um, let's say you've got a big important job interview and you're feeling really, really anxious about this interview, it's, it's perfectly understandable that you'd say, you know, it's my interview coming up that's making me feel so scared and so nervous and so I've got all these butterflies in my stomach. Well, that's just a misunderstanding because uh, the interview is not making you feel any way at all. An interview can't make you feel any way. An interview has no ability in and of itself to make anybody feel anything, even though it seems like that's what's happening. What's actually happening is you're experiencing your thinking. You're experiencing the thinking that you're doing about this interview. You know? And so if you have anxious thinking, you feel anxious. If you have excited thinking, you feel excited. If you feel ambivalent and you've got ambivalent thinking going on, that's all it is. That's, that's all we ever have is just the thought that's present in the moment leads to the experience that we're having. And, you know, very often people go, okay, well, hang on a second. No, no, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Well, in my world, it most certainly does. And um, in the world of my clients for the last 10 or 12 years, it kind of does too, because um, people make amazing changes to themselves when they realize how things are actually happening, how things are actually developing, rather than being caught up in thinking that something else has the power to make them feel a certain way. So if somebody's out in the golf course, and um, let's say they've had two doubles, and they're absolutely steaming mad with themselves. Now we've all been there mm. and we go, oh, you know, that, that gorse book on the, the last hole, the gorse bush on the last hole, or that guy that shouted for the top of my backswing, blah, 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 blah. all these things rattling around on the inside of our heads. Well, that's just our thinking about those things going on in the moment. And we have a choice as to whether we let that thinking hang around and we follow it and we, we respond to it, or we just realize that that's what it is. It's just a thought. And that if we leave it alone, it'll just pass. It'll pass really quickly. It'll pass as soon as our playing partner says to us, hey, w was that an eight or a nine that you got in the last one there, right? Your thinking has changed again. And you might start to laugh and say, look, it was only a six. Oh, it seemed like a lot more to me, right? You're now having a different experience because your thinking's changed. And so with, with sports people and business people and with people who are maybe just uh, experiencing some stuff in their lives just now that, that they're finding difficult, when they understand the source of their feelings, and when they understand how it works, things just change. They, they, they're not victims of circumstance anymore. 
they are choose to follow the thoughts that serve them well, and they're equally free to choose the thoughts that don't serve them well, but, but they have a choice. Whereas if you think you're a victim of circumstance, you don't have a choice. Sorry, that was very long-winded for what no, was meant to be a very simple explanation. Yeah, that's a fan, fantastic answer. So I guess um, moving on from that is, uh, it's obviously when, once you're in the thick of it, it's it's very hard to uh, to see clearly or to talk, change your state. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. So the other day I was playing with my best friend at um, a local course and I got off to a really rough start. I had a a double and a bogey within the first four holes. And I said to him, oh, that's, you know, it's, it's always tough to then sort of get going for the rest of the round when you get off to a slow start. And he said, and he's, he's, a, he's off a, a higher handicap than I was, or I am. And he said, I actually quite like getting off to a rough start because then it gives me an opportunity to grind out a really good round from there. And all of a sudden, my mind or analogy or way of thinking changed on that very next tee box because it he presented it in a my environment in a in a very different limelight as as an opportunity rather than uh you know it's going to be a wasted afternoon i can't get under par uh it's going to be really really tough but then he must sort of made it a challenge so that was a really good pattern interrupt of um a way of i of the way i was currently thinking um so i was wondering does it take like a a sort of a, pa- a pattern interrupt or a state change. Um, you know, if you if you wake up feeling bad, you could go and do some exercise or take a cold shower, for example, to change yeah. to change your state. So, how does one uh, sort of break the pattern of thinking and, and actually focus on what they want to do? Well, see, the, the the situation you described there is an interesting one, um, and and so is the non complementary you use. Like a pattern interrupt is is uh, is a phrase that's widely used within. Uh, the field of coaching, and it and it comes from the world of NLP and hypnosis, um, and it's it's sort of used to describe an external intervention which uh, disrupts a pain a train of thought and then leads to fresh thinking, um, and that's true it does, but you don't actually need a pattern interrupt to do that. You you can you can interrupt your own pattern at any time. It doesn't need an external source. And now it was interesting that the the, the circumstance that you described there. Um, any hypothetical golfer starting off with, um, you know, double bogey, bogey, or whatever, whatever it happens to be, um, the experience will change according to the individual. So, for example, the individual that you happen to be on that hypothetical day, with, with that thinking that you were doing at that time, had a completely different experience than a person who was doing different thinking about the same experience. Okay, so the thinking that you were doing was, gosh, this makes it really hard. The other person's thinking was, this gives me an opportunity. Okay, it's it's just different thinking. And the different thinking leads to a different experience. Okay, and that's all it is. It, it's it's nothing more complicated than that. Um, so when, when you say, you know, hey, this person always has a really positive outlook, well, that may well be um, a natural trait for them. It might just be a habit, or they may have stumbled um, into a situation where they just have worked out themselves that the more options that I give myself to view this in a different way, the more likely my results are likely to please me. Whereas a person may also have developed a habit that says, I don't want to be disappointed anymore, therefore I'll set my expectations really, really low, and then when the worst happens, I'm not that disappointed. It's it's just a different way of examining what's possible. And so for the person with the very dim view is shutting out loads and loads of possibilities, whereas the person with a slightly more positive view isn't excluding the negative, but they don't really figure in it because they're, they're looking at so many more options. And an interesting little exercise for this was I, I was up at – uh, a university a little while ago we were doing some performance coaching for the for the university team there and uh, i brought up a bunch of old kitchen roll tubes and i cut them into different lengths some of them were only about three quarters of an inch some of them a couple of inches some of them six inches and some of the full length and there are about 20 odd young people in this room and we dished them all out and said right you've got a beautiful view out the window there i want you all to have a look at this view and just notice what you can see so they spent maybe 30, 40 seconds doing that. Then they each had, they had to close an eye and look through the, the, you know, the kitchen roll tube. 
So what can you see now? And the people with the very long tubes, of course, had a very limited view. Uh, the people with the shorter tubes could see more, but still not as much as if they weren't looking through down the tube at all. And, you know, we got talking about all that stuff that you could see out the, there before is still there. But because of the implement that you've got in front of your eye, you can't see it. So for all intents and purposes, if that's the way you're looking at things, the rest of the stuff doesn't exist in, in, except in isolation as you look down a tube. And, um, you know, that can be very helpful on you know, some occasions. So if, if you're, um, I don't know, shooting at targets and you want that tiny little area of attention to, to be focused on, that's great. But if you're trying to plan a route across the countryside, then maybe what you want to do is take the goggles off and, and, and take in the whole picture. So it, it's about choosing which gives you the most appropriate options. Hmm. And, and that kind of means if you catch yourself in some pretty crummy thinking, just think about something else. You know, phone a mate up, talk to somebody, stop and speak to a stranger in the street, read a newspaper headline. As soon as your mind occupies itself with something else, just for a moment, you get fresh thought appearing. And you're only ever one thought away from exactly where you need to be. That's the astonishing thing. Uh, and I guess it, it, so when you, when you start sort of maybe thinking down sort of a negative route or, you know, fears come into the mind such as, oh, I, I see the out of bounds, I, I see the water, that internal dialogue, which becomes very negative. It, I guess the first thing to do is, is to be very aware of that and actually catch yourself saying, hang on a second, I, I, I'm, I'm noticing a pattern here or I'm noticing a, my internal dialogue is, is, is heading in perhaps an, a, a, a not a very helpful uh, way. So, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, he, here's an interesting thing. I've got a question for you. Okay. Can you ride a bicycle? Uh, yes, I can. Have you ever ridden a bicycle with no hands? Yes. Okay. So when you're a kid, there's nothing better than getting on your bike, cycling home from school, and then you look like a cocky little git, and you put your hands behind your back, and you're whistling, and you're cycling along road, road with no hands, steering this bicycle simply by shifting your weight left and right. Yeah. And, and you just think, man, this is just so easy. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. So you got this kid. And uh, he cycles well, and he can cycle with, with no hands. He can probably cycle with no hands with his eyes shut as well. Um, and there's nothing getting in the way. There's, there's nothing intellectual happening whilst you're riding your bike with, with no hands. You're just, you're just doing it. And you're taking in what's going on around you. Hopefully, you're paying attention to the traffic and anybody else. But you're not thinking about riding a bike. You're not thinking about maintaining balance. You're just... You're just following the somatic knowledge that your body already has, you know, this deeply embedded skill and letting your body take care of the bike riding for you. Mm. Is that fair? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So on the driving range, um, you've warmed up and there's nothing fundamentally bad happening on the day. So you're enjoying an average to slightly average session at the range and you've got 10 drivers to hit. You've got 10 balls left. So you tee up 10. How many of those 10 are going to be acceptable to you, do you reckon? On the range, not on the golf course, just on the range. Uh, six. Six, okay. Six will be acceptable. What about the other four? Will they all be ropey or uh, they all be disastrous or will there be degrees of ropiness involved in them? Yeah, one would be okay. The other two may be acceptable and then perhaps one may be out of bounds on the range. Oh, okay. yeah. Right, okay. So one in 10 is is not what you want. Yeah. So you got a 90% hit rate. So if we say that there's 10 units of performance per drive you've, out of 100, you've just hit around about no less than 60. But in terms of utility, maybe let's call it 80. Is that fair enough? That's fair. Yep. Okay. So you're doing that in the range, but you also did that in the bike. There's no thought going on. And then you go out in the golf course and you got a card in your hand, you come to 17. 17 is a really, really tight drive. What's your standard shape of shot, Chris? Draw or fade? A uh, little fade. Little fade. Okay. Well, you need to hit a little draw here. Okay. 
Okay, there's a big bunker down the right hand side. If, if you overcook it, there's that OB down the left. So you have to hit a tight little, uh, 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 a lovely little soft draw. Okay. Okay, and you got to hit this. So now what happens to you as you stand on the tee? Is, is, it, is it the same as riding a bike with no hands when you're a kid? No, you go through the, uh, the very analytical uh, swing techniques and yeah, uh, yeah, all, all, all of the all of the fear of uh, getting knocked off the bike. I'd imagine. Yeah, that's we we just do all that strange stuff to ourselves, don't we? Yeah. Okay, well, here, here's an example. I can right? actually I can actually feel actually not wanting to hit that draw. <laughs> I'd well, be like, yeah, give me the little fade back or something. Okay, well, we're going to come back to that in a second. But this conversation that we've just had about the, the, the OB down the left and, you know, the, the haven't hit a shot, which is counter to the one that feels best most of the time. I was having a conversation about this with a young pro um, the other night. And uh, before his round, he was he, he was going through the I'm really hitting the ball so well on the range. And there just seems to be this magic portal that I walk through when I walk onto the first tee. And then just something happens. And I don't know what it is. You know, my head's not racing, but there's there is just something different, and I don't know what it is. Well, he does know what it is. What it is is that his thinking has changed. Because you can still be thinking thoughts, even though there's no words attached to them. And what I mean by that is, let's say um, you're thrown onto the, the, the first ever really really busy. Uh, first tea environment where there's grandstands filled with people cheering and all the rest of that. Mm. Okay. When you walk into that, you, you have a different feeling. It's, it's a different environment. So you respond to it slightly differently. And he was kind of describing walking through the portal that even though there wasn't, you know, a large amount of thinking, his thinking was subtly changing. And that feeling that you get when you walk into the big stage, even though there's no words attached to it, you know what the feeling is. You know, you might you you might later on say, "Gosh, I feel a bit anxious here." Or, wow, I've got the butterflies. Or, or this is fantastic. But you put the words onto it later on because you you don't need words attached to the thought for the thought to be present. And so what I said to him is, "So you you, you walk onto this first tee and something's different." I said, "Yeah." I said, "Well, is is it a little bit different in the sense that on that bit of of the planet where that first tee happens to be that gravity is different?" Says, no, don't be silly. Okay, is the atmospheric pressure different? No. Are there magic incantations or spell, spells being cast in that area? No. Um, are people throwing things at you? No. Okay, so what's the only thing that can happen in order for you to have a slightly different experience when you walk onto that tease? Well, my thinking's changing, isn't it? He goes, yeah, I suppose it probably is. And, I'm going, well, and he says, so what do I do about that? And he was really disappointed because the answer was nothing. There's nothing you can do about it because you're going to think what you're going to think anyway. Now you can you can distract yourself. You can have a conversation with people, but we can't we can't control thought. Right? And for anybody who says they can, I'll put 50p down on the table and says, okay, there's my 50p. You put your 50p down, now, and I want you to go for a whole minute and not think about a single thing. And after about 15 seconds, you can give me my 50p and yeah. your 50p. Yeah, you'd be a very wealthy man, yeah. yeah. Right, so we, it, it's, it's, it's not helpful to think that we can control thought. But what we can do is we can choose to act upon thoughts or pay attention to thoughts, or we can choose to kind of ignore them and just let them pass. Now, with this particular player, um, we got him to do a little thing that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, which kind of bypasses thought. It's it, it's a very in-body experience, which is quite captivating. And the sensation that people get from this usually lasts just long enough to be able to walk from that little state to address the ball, put a swing on it, watch it land in the middle of the fairway, pick up the tee and smile, and then walk after it. And that's just long enough. But before we get onto that, Will you play a little game with me? Absolutely, let's do it. Okay. Are you sitting comfortably? I certainly am. Is this for the listeners as well to take part? Oh in? yeah. Well, no. If 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 there, if if there is anybody out there listening to this, okay. then, <laughs> you know, um, 
have a go at it. Just just notice what happens. It's there's it's just a little game. It's just a fun little experiment. There's no right result. There's no wrong result. You'll experience what you experience, and whatever you experience, you're the one that's done it. Okay, we'll be okay. in it all together. We'll be in it all together, and there's no harm can come of it. Okay. So the first thing is if if you're sitting there with your eyes closed, um, I'd, I'd like you to to either imagine or recall a moment that made you feel uncomfortable. Not frightened. I don't want you to go to a scary place, but perhaps an embarrassing moment or a moment um, that challenged you as to what do I do with this? What do I do next? That made you feel uncomfortable. Can you think of a moment like that? I've, I've, I've got one and I hope all the listeners okay. do as well. <laughs> Every, everybody's got one. Yeah. Okay. But as you, Chris, as you think of yours, mm-hmm. I want you to go and imagine yourself being in that position now and being in that environment. And if there are any words being spoken, listen to the words. If, if it's actions that are causing you any discomfort, whatever it happens to be, whatever's creating the experience for you, just pay attention to it. And then notice where in your body you feel your response. Okay. Okay. Do you know where that, where in your body that is? Uh, it's, it's a stomach churning. Uh, it's a stomach churning. Okay. Lovely. Let's just stop that. Forget that. Open your eyes. Dance around the room. Give yourself a good shake. Sit back down again and close your eyes again. And this time, what I'd like you to do is imagine somebody in your life, someone who's really means something to you, somebody that um, is important in a big way. It could be a family tie or a friendship or a romance, but somebody that when you visualize their face in front of you, and you can see their face in front of you in your mind's eye. And they're only about 18 inches away from you. And you look at them. And as you're gazing at them, they give you a little look that you know they've reserved just for you. And when you see that look, you just, you know what that means. And you have the response that you have about this very important person in your life. You got that? Yes, yeah, certainly do. Okay, now, where are you experiencing that response? That that for me was a, a, a sort of a lightness in the shoulders and a very lightness across the chest. Okay, right. So open your eyes again. The, the, the game's over. Now, you had two different experiences there. Is the person that you were thinking about, are they beside you? Uh, no, none, none of them are. Yeah. Are they in the same room? No, it's just me up here. <laughs> All right. So are they anywhere near you? No, certainly not. No. Okay. And the um, the first experience that you had, are you in the place where that occurred? I'm not, no. No. And are there people that might have been involved with that with you as well there? No, they're not. Okay. So how were you able to create two physiological experiences when none of the people or the circumstances were present? A lot of attachment to feelings and associations with a with an experience. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's 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 really complicated. That <laughs> is it. I don't. I, that that's what would come up for me initially. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, what what was taking place in your mind on each occasion? What were you doing? You were engaged in the act of remembering, thinking. Mm. It's just thought. I, I gave you a really simple instruction, and it was a suggestion that you were happy to follow, and you followed it, and you used the power of thought to create thinking that created experiences for you that gave you two separate representations, one more pleasant than the other. And it was as a result of the thinking that you were doing in those moments, your body aligned itself physiologically to give you the physical sensation that corresponds to the thought that you were thinking that you're doing. And that's how we make sense of the world. That's how it works. And that to me is absolutely amazing mm. because th- that means we hold all the cards. Mm. Right? No, nobody can make us sad. 
we, we can have sad thoughts, but nobody can make us sad. And one of the guys that, uh, that I do some work with, he's, he's over in the States. He, he had this great, this great story about some guy turned up at his house to do some work and um, didn't do a particularly job. And so he was, you know, said, well, look, I'll, I'll pay you for the work that you've done, but you kind of need to go now. And uh, so the guy left and um, uh, he came back an hour later and said, look, I, I owe you a big apology. Um, I don't want to take your money, but I would like uh, a chance to um, not only put the job right, but do an absolutely stellar job for you because, you know, my reputation is important to me. Is that OK? And, you know, my chum said, well, that's that's fantastic. Yeah, of course, you know, knock yourself out. And the guy said, I really didn't want to offend you. And, you know, a colleague said, I had, it was everything, I had to do everything to say, my friend, there's absolutely nothing you can say or do that would, can, that can cause me offense. Hmm. And what he meant by that was the only, per, the only person that can create the offense would, would have been him himself. Hmm. Okay. You know, if offense is in the receiver, is in the recipient. Um, and, and so when you start realizing what becomes possible for people, when they're creating their own experiences moment by moment, then wow, you know, anything's possible in two directions. One, if we go back to stuff which isn't particularly helpful for us, you know, like perhaps people have had traumatic childhoods or they've had experiences that continue to cause them grief. Well, see, those things aren't happening anymore. You know, those things aren't happening anymore. The, the only thing that's happening in the moment is the principle of thought is an operation in the moment and the person's experiencing the physio physiological reaction to the thinking that they're doing. There's a, there's a book I, I read actually this week. It's called um, Obstacle, Obstacle is the Way, and it's um, by a chap called Ryan Holiday. Um, I've read it a couple of times now, actually, but it, it's, it's based on stoicism, and um, there, there's a one chapter in there about Hurricane Carter and what that story you just told actually reminded me of, of this chapter. And that was Hurricane Carter was obviously this uh, formidable one of the, I think he was the best boxer in his, in his time. And he was wrongfully locked up in prison for, I think, 19 years. Wow. And, uh, he, you know, he was world heavy champ, heavyweight champion of the world. And he rocked up to uh, the prison wearing a sort of five thousand dollar suit, a Rolex, and you know he was he was going to be sentenced for nineteen years. But he said to the guards upon entry, he said, um, "Nothing you, uh, you know, this environment or whatever you're going to do to me is is never going to affect who I am and what I think. I, I'm in control of my own thoughts, and I'm in control of of how they sort of act upon me. So." So whatever you do or whatever you think you want to do, I just want to let you know that none of it's going to affect me. And so he spent his time uh, basically learning about uh, the law and fighting his case. He would wake up in the morning and read books um, about his case and uh, the justice system. And he did that every day, I think, for sort of, sort of on and off 15, 19 years and took his court case to trial twice during that time. And he was let out free, uh, wrongfully accused. And when a pos you know, when he was asked, uh, you know, do you feel like you've been robbed of the last 19 years? He said, no, um, you know, I was in charge of all my own thoughts and the way it felt. That's amazing, isn't it? Mm. So some people, some people stumble upon this understanding of this gift or whatever you want to call it. Um, that everyone's got every everyone innately knows how it works um you know you came you came into the world knowing how it works um you know the when a, when a baby's first pops into the world you know that babies don't pop in the world into the world you know worrying about um you know the political um situation that might be present or the world economy or anything else like that they they just have a couple of things on their mind one is one is warmth and the other one's nourishment um, they don't have any opinions. They don't have any prejudices. They they simply are being, right? And so we we start off in a in a, in a wonderfully innocent um, 
position. And then, of course, over the years, we learn to start associating um, feelings with circumstances. But it, it, it kind of reminds me of the, um, uh, well, my favorite example of the, of, of, of the misunderstanding, if, if, if I may bore you with it for a moment, is, um, you know, the, the folks used to believe um, that the sun went round the earth. Right? And now apparently we know better, but um, it was a big deal. Um, in Copernicus's time to, to actually raise that as an issue because it, it flew against all convention. And of course, to hold beliefs like that was, was very dangerous and, and people suffered physically as a result from uh, working on stuff like this. But it's interesting how we can, we can still fall into it. And one of the examples I'll, I'll use with, with people is, you know, let's, let's pretend Chris and Ross decide to go and sit on Chris's roof for a year. Okay. So we bring up a couple of chairs and we bring up loads of granola and bananas and fruit for breakfast and stuff like that. And we sit and we face south for 365 days. And we've got clothing which will allow us to do that and all the good stuff that we need. But we'll notice that every day that the sun will come up in one place and it'll arc through the sky and it'll disappear in another place. And even if it's cloudy, we can still kind of see the sun moving through the clouds. But it does that the same thing all 365 days. And the only thing that changes is that according to the season, it's sometimes higher in the sky or lower in the sky. But it always arrives in the east and it always goes away in the west. So when it goes in the way, away in the west, where does it go? What happens to it? Where does it go? Um. Is, is it is it you asking me on that? Well, it's just designed to elicit a pregnant pause because most people <laughs> do what you do because you know the answer. Yeah. But the logical answer is, well, it goes down around the back and it cu comes up again on the other side. Because it's, it's, it's moving in a circular orbit because we haven't moved for 365 days. Okay. So it's a perfectly reasonable expectation to make a statement that the, the sun does indeed go around the earth. You're not nuts for thinking that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, but it never has and it never will. It's just the way that it looks. Interesting analogy. Okay. And so it can seem that our, uh, that our, our feelings are coming from our circumstances. It can seem that um, our irritation is coming from a colleague that's not pulling their weight. It can seem that our brother and sister is a real pain in the backside because they've nicked our Xbox. Right? It's perfectly reasonable to be caught up in that misunderstanding, but that's not the way it works. And having that knowledge in the way that Hurricane Carter did is that the experience that I have will come from the thinking that I'm doing moment by moment gives people fantastic power and a huge number of options that weren't present before. Mm. And that to, that to me is just the essence of performance. That's how people perform because they know how it works and they get out their own way. I want to bring up this story of the, you and your parakeet, um, or, or how I spelt it very differently to uh, when I asked you the question. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, we can touch on that in a second. But I do want to tell... Uh, just two very quick stories um, based on this uh, quickly first, uh, otherwise I'll forget. But um, I was, I luckily got, I managed to go to Wentworth, um, the Rolex series event at uh, the European Tour. Um, they held it each year at Wentworth Golf Club in Surrey. And I've been going there since I was sort of, uh, you know, 12, 13 years old. And last year I witnessed uh, uh two pretty amazing things. And I think I may have even touched on this on the podcast before, but one of them was Ian Poulter was on the range warming up and he, it was a Thursday. His tea time was about 10 o'clock. He got to the range about half seven and he could not find it. He was hitting left fence with his driver, right fence with his driver. He had uh, the two way miss, which is the, 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 the sort of disaster moment with any golfer. You mm. don't know where it's going. It was going left or right. Uh, he was chunking wedges. And, I mean, if you had any money, you you would have shorted his, his odds. Uh, <laughs> you put your house on it. Anyway, 
as he walks over to the the first tee, which is only sort of a 200 yard walk at Wentworth, um, obviously his internal dialogue is something was, he was saying something to himself because he went out that day and I think he shot three or four under and was tied for top 10. (laughs) So how, so how can, (laughs) you know, the internal dialogue from him walking to that range to the first tee is, is, is something very different from the results he's just witnessed. Um, Yeah, I I, I think, I think most pros will tell you that, though. I mean, um, Lee Westwood will tell you a similar story that that, that basically um, he doesn't prejudice um, the outcome of a round by how he's hitting it on the range before he goes out. Okay. As far it, it, what Lee was saying to me was, as far as he's concerned, is that he goes out there to warm up, and he just kind of gets an idea of what it might be like for the day. You know, if today's a soft draw day or if today's a soft fade day. Um, and that's okay. that's it. No, he doesn't go there to fix stuff. He fixes stuff somewhere else. And he said, you know, a little bit like you, you're describing in pool through there. He said, you walk from the practice ground to the putting green, and then you walk from the putting green to the first tee. Um, you you don't know what's going to show up until you show up. Mm-hmm. But the, the, here's an interesting one. Um, here here's a little thing for you to try, because this this never ceases to amaze me. Um, if you Right. This this makes the assumption that whoever's doing this has a reasonable understanding of how to swing a golf club. Okay, so if what you're doing is you're whipping it around your ankles and then you're doing a pirouette and jumping four times, then this is probably going to be a hard one to pull off. You don't try this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but but if you're if you have something that approximates um, something that people would recognize as a golf swing, then then um, you and and whoever might be listening, give this a go the next time you're down the range. Is once you're warmed up and you've hit a few and you're quite happy with it, um, take out a wedge or nine iron and then start to hit gentle little shots, maybe 40 to 50 yards, just with your eyes shut. Right? And you, what, what you're not doing is you're not interested in the quality of the shot. What, what you're interested in is forming a relationship with the club head. And what I mean by that is that when you're swinging a weight on the end of a stick, Uh, with your eyes closed, the first thing that your body wants to do is protect itself by remaining in balance. Your body's going to do everything that it can to stop you falling over. And as you start swinging this thing back and forth, just, you know, every, you know, four or five eyes closed practice swings at about 50 to 75% effort back and forth and back and forth. Then hit a shot and see how that feels. And then just keep doing that for a while. And notice what happens. Because if you have something approximating a golf swing, uh, in order to remain in balance all the way through the motion, all the way through the golf swing itself, then the club will kind of need to be in positions of balance. So coaches would say it's highly likely that the golf club is in the right positions during the course of the swing. But the thing about moving a golf club through space with your eyes closed is that you're not aware of any of that. What you're doing is you're making these tiny little adjustments on the fly with the sole purpose of being in balance and the club finds its own slot. Now you can actually start hitting full shots with a nine iron doing that. Um, and I've had players go all the way through the bag, right up to the driver. Um, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely astonishing to see how well people can hit the golf ball when there isn't a ball there to be struck. Um, and you know, this, this young player that I mentioned to you earlier on who had a similar tee shot to the one that you were talking about, there was trouble down one side, trouble down the other side. And the tee shot that he had to hit was the one was in, that was in the opposite direction to his favored shape. And what he did was what I'm suggesting now was he stood there on the tee as he was waiting for his his turn to, 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 to play off. And he just gently swinging back and forth with his eyes closed and the driver just going, man, that feels good. I just feel so balanced and because, or he he was. So you just take that feeling and say, that's the swing I'm going to put on it. And he just sent it straight down the middle of the fairway. And, and he said that, you know, that he's done that quite a lot, but it was, it was the realization that it was just such a simple thing to do. It, It was the polar opposite of getting wrapped up in technique and trying, trying harder and harder. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was like, I'm riding down this street with my eyes closed with 
with no hands on the wheel on on the on the bicycle handlebars here because i i know what to do as long as i'm in balance i'm just fine and another quick adjunct to that story it, um I, I i think i mentioned to you the last time we spoke that um a few years back i did some work with a bunch of irish golf coaches at a bunch called aspire golf ireland and we did most of our work out of Rossapena. And on this one particular day, I was out with three young lads and uh, the weather turned and we had four holes to go. And I said, right, guys, we got to get back in quick because this is going to get really nasty really quick. So why don't we do this? You each play two balls. You play one ball with your eyes open and you play one ball with your eyes closed. Okay. And they went, you're nuts. I said, what do you got to lose except four golf balls? Right. So what they did was they each played two balls. The eyes closed balls between the three of them were a cumulative two under after four holes. Okay. And the cumulative between the three of them eyes open balls were two over. Wow. Now, that just astonishes me because humans are really, really good at staying in balance. And when the ball's not there to be struck and all you're concerned about is just I just want to be able to hold my follow through for maybe five or ten seconds when I'm finished. The body seems to do everything that it needs to do by itself without any intellectual input. So give that a go. See how you get on. That sounds a, a really good challenge for all the listeners on, on top of all, what we've already talked about. Um, well, you should have seen Clarkie hitting them over the uh, the end of the bar- barrier at the uh, at the old course at St. Andrews at the Benson and Hedges a while back. I've never seen a ball fly that far in my life. Really? Okay. Um, I, I, we will come to your action challenge and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll come to appreciate of your time. So I was wondering if perhaps there is a, a story that you would like to sort of just f- in final words or share with us, uh, with perhaps a player you've worked with, um, that you think is worth sharing. Um, it, it could be anything. It didn't have, didn't have to be related to golf. Maybe it could be something else. Um, well, you know, r- rather than. Rather than have it being a story, um, could it, 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 if I could leave you with something which um, I have found immensely helpful in my life. For sure. Is this, is this your action challenge? Is it all? Or is it just- um, yeah, well, yeah, you could call it that. Okay. You, you, right. you could call it that. Um, and, it, and, it, and it relates specifically to performance. Okay, because one of the problems that I have as a coach helping the people get more of their units is that I have the same problem that they do. Okay, if I have 100 units, I still get stuck at 55 to 62. So how, how do I make sure that I'm doing what I need to do in a practical sense as well as, um, you know, a thinking sense to make sure that I'm going towards the things that I say they want? and the th- it, it kind of comes from a definition that um, an old chum of mine, Joe Riggio, came up with, which is basically performance is um, is having made a decision about something. Is that you link that decision to actions, to specified actions that will lead you to the outcomes that you're looking for. And what Joe said was, loads of us make loads of decisions. And loads of us have outcomes that we desire, but most of us fall down in the middle bit, which is mapping the required action onto the decision. So it's easy to take actions that don't serve us well because they might be fun to do, but we need to be really specific about what is it that I need to do now in support of the decision that I've made that will take me to what it is I say that I want. And I find myself having to work really hard at that because I don't know about you, but sometimes I just got sidetracked by really interesting stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, really, 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 really interesting stuff that I have to attend to now because it's so sparkly and shiny. <laughs> you know, the magpie in me goes now, 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 but it's not what I need to be doing. And so Joseph's uh, description there of the definition of personal power is having made a decision is to take the action that's appropriate to support that decision, to give the give you the outcome you seek. So that would be one that's worked well for me, and I'd certainly like to share it with everybody else that might be interested in it. That's that's a wonderful one, yeah, absolutely. Is there um, is there perhaps an example you could share with us that you've uh, 
perhaps <laughs> define define something very uh, specifically and then um, maybe put in sort of five things or actions to help get you there and in the course of time or um well i'll like uh, that or? uh well it, it, I'll, I'll bring you back to a golfing one okay um and i mean this maybe sounds really dumb um but if you ask a golfer you know so, so what do you want out of your game i want to play better shoot lower scores and enjoy it more mm. that sounds pretty typical yeah so if you ask him, so hey, what are you doing about achieving that? How how do you would you what are the things that you do to go around delivering that for yourself? Well, I practice a lot, okay, uh, and I play quite regularly. Well, that's okay. Um, so let's what is, what is the objective of the game again? Well, in match play, it's to win the match, and in stroke play, it's to shoot the lowest score. Okay, stroke play is golf any more complicated than shooting the lowest score? No. I don't think it is. Is it? No. Okay. So the lowest score wins. So in order to shoot the lowest score, you have to take the fewest shots possible. Yeah. Okay. So what do you practice? Well, my driving's not very good. You know, my long irons aren't very good. And then we go down the, the old stats route, which is chipping and putting and chipping and putting and chipping and putting. And, you know, that I want to be a better player. I want to enjoy my game more and I want to shoot lower scores. Well, being out on the range batting yellow balls into the distance, in my experience, has very little to do with shooting lower scores. Uh, what leads to lower scores is knowing how to chip and putt, knowing how to get up and down from 50 to 60 yards. That, to me, is, is taking action which is appropriate to supporting the decision that you've made to become a better player. Hmm. You know, right? the, the action of beating drivers down at the range – that's just a hobby. Hmm. That, that's 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 not leading to what golf is. Golf is shooting lower scores. And there are plenty of guys out there on tour making shed loads of money that have only got 65 units. Hmm. But the thing is, they're getting access to 62 or 63 of them. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, you know, the guy who the guy who's only got sixty-five units. If you're only if you're only getting access to sixty, he gets sixty-one. He beats you. He shoots lower scores. So, you know, taking actions that support your purpose in a golfing context would be look at where you're dropping your shots and go and get really good at that bit. And I'm amazed at how many players come back to me and say, "Well, I don't really enjoy that very much." I go, wow, you make your living at this game? Yeah. <laughs> you know, are you serious? But hey, that, that's just me. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a great one to finish on. I think it's it's the classic rule of thumb is that we, we run away from the things that we or that we fear most or what we actually most needed to do as well. Yeah, it's part of the fun of being human, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, just one last question before uh, you go. You just seem very uh, a very well-read person um or individual is what any recommended reading material or books for uh again it doesn't have to be golf related it could be um a blend of golf life and and it, no it, I, I i don't i don't i don't read golf stuff um and and i don't read um books on mental power and performance and all the rest of that because it, it seems to me that those are are basically interventions that aren't helpful. I, I, my, my ambition is to get people doing less thinking, not more thinking. Um, but in terms of books, um, a great book that I thoroughly enjoy and I read many times is one called uh, Prometheus Rising by a guy called Robert Anton Wilson. Um, it has all sorts of weird and wacky stuff in there. And if you ever want to see how some of the amazing things you can do with language, um, go and buy that. He talks about E prime in there. And I won't tell you what that is. You'll have to go and look it up. Okay. Um, there's another one, which is by, um, a physicist called Carlo Rovelli. And it's basically, um, trying to explain quantum gravity to lay people. And it's called reality is not what it seems. Um, that's a great read. I thoroughly enjoyed that, but probably the most important ones for me are anything by Flann O'Brien. I don't know if you've heard of Flann O'Brien. His real name was Brian O'Nolan. I think it was. And um, he's a, an Irish writer who's a compatriot of Joyce. And um, he has that wonderful Irish gift 
of being able to do things with the English language that only the Irish can do. Okay. And uh, he, he wrote five or six great little um, ridiculously comic stories, um, which are just way out there. I don't know what he was taking at the time, but <laughs> delightful, absolutely delightful. So if you fancy a gentle laugh and, and a trip to your dictionary, um, then I would recommend anything by uh, Flann O'Brien. Great, wonderful. And uh, there was one in Nemo you sent me. Is it um, somebody should have told us? Was that another good one? Um, um, yes. Um, simple truths thanks. for living well. Yes. Um, that that I didn't want to. Seeing as you raised it, yes, let's raise it because I didn't want to come across as too preachy, even though I've probably been very preachy. But no, um, uh, somebody should have told us is a very gentle book written by a very wise fellow called Dr. Jack Pransky, and I suggest to every one of my clients that they pick it up off Amazon. It's only about four quid for a Kindle version of it. Um, it's it's a, a pick upable, put downable, one page at a time kind of thing, and it very gently explains the things that I was trying to explain earlier on in a far better way than I can ever hope to. But it's a very gentle book and I haven't come across anybody yet that hasn't found it profoundly helpful. Wonderful. I'll be sure to include all of them in the show notes. Um, Ross, uh, thank you so much for this. Um, where, where, where can people find more about you and uh, hit, you know, if they want to get in touch, where, where, where can they go? Oh, well, if they want to get in touch, more than delighted to hear it from them. Um, the best place is just through the website. Um, the website is rossmckenzie.net, and it, that's all one word. Um, and Mackenzie is M-A-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E. So rossmckenzie.net is my website. There's contact uh, uh, information there. Ping me an email um, or, you know, drop me a note on Twitter or something like that. Um, what, is, what is your Twitter handle? Uh, Ross Inside Out. Ross Inside Out. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you so much again and uh, hopefully do a round two at some time and it would be uh, wonderful to get you back on here because that was, uh, well, was so many gems. You, well, um, before you start saying stuff like that, just <laughs> wait for your wait for your listeners' feedback. Yeah. Maybe they've had enough after this. So, But it's been a very great pleasure, Chris. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's much appreciated. No, well, thank you and thank you for your time and uh, we'll hopefully have a, a knock on the range sometime soon. I, that with, would be great. With, with our eyes closed. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Chris. Okay, cheers, Ross. Bye-bye.